So good morning, everybody. We start off the meeting by saying I'm Cindy Boldick, the Outfitter Guide Program Coordinator for the Oregon State Marine Board. Um, the current time is. I'm going to look on my computer instead. 10.06, 10.07, sorry. And the guide advisory meeting is now called to order. Um, this is a public meeting, but the committee will not be requesting or receiving any public comment or testimony on any item on today's agenda. The guide advisory committee does not have authority to make rules or statutory changes for the Marine Board administration. Therefore, no public comment will be heard by the committee. If you wish to raise items for discussion, please contact one of our committee members or the agency contact Jennifer Cooper. So welcome. Um, I'd like to start by just taking attendance, making sure, seeing who we've got here. Um, Gary Early, I do not see at this point. Bob Reeves, I this see is, you. Hi, this, Bob. Is, this is Val. Oh, hi, Val. There, I saw a phone number. I wasn't sure. Yeah, well, we're awesome. having trouble getting Gary on. We're not in the same place, so I need okay. to figure out. I need to call him and have him dial in. Okay, and I think Brian just sent out the link again, too, so. Okay, All right. well, if he sent the link to Gary, then that'll be helpful. Maybe he can get on. Okay, yeah, he I'll did. Just, just mute me again, and I'll try to walk him through it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Bob Reese, I see you. Hi, Bob. Hi. Good morning. Joe Rolater, welcome. Brian Sykes, I do not see, but I think he will be joining us. Randy Turney, don't see it. Cliff Agos, Jim Blount, I saw just join us. Hi, Jim. Cody Cole, do not see it. Bill Monroe Jr. Great. Bill, are you Good still morning. calling? In? Good morning. Yes, I do not have that that link. My my old um, Teams link is not working. I, I'll wait for okay. the. You can send it whenever, and I'll hop on whenever. It should be coming from Brian. Brian Paulson. He just sent out the links to everybody again. I did okay, send cool. it out, Cindy. Thank you, Brian. Jason Schultz. Hi, Jason. Good morning. Good morning. Mia Shepard. Hi, Mia. Well, and then Brian Paulson and Sergeant Galusha. Brian Paulson, present by video. Hey, Cindy, I'm, I'm present. Hi, Clint. Thanks. All right, our first item is the approval of the minutes of the last meeting. Hard to believe it was uh, February 15th, so unfortunately almost a year ago. But any, are there any comments or edits needed for the um, minutes for the February 15th meeting? All right, I'm going to take that as a unanimous, but they are fine to take as official minutes for today. Um, I will do my usual renewal wrap up or roundup update for status of last year and then how we're doing so far this year. Um, you should have a document that has my um, the stats for the years. The past year we ended 2023 with a record 1535 guides. That was uh, 69 over the previous year. And uh, we had 215 new, never before registered guides. Um, it's been 150 to 190 last year. You actually can see there's a new little chart on the bottom right page of the stats that shows the growth comparisons. So we had about 14% of our guides as brand new. That's kind of right in line with the 11 to 13. We've had percent change in the last five years. Um, our 1535 was a 4.7 jump percent jump, which isn't as bad as the growth in the couple of years beforehand. Um, you can all see where the 2020 was a definitely a down year for everyone. And then we slowly been building back up from that. Um, we had um, 
we still had 191 guides in from 2022 that did not renew for 2023. So, and then the current renewal period, we're um, we've hit approximately 725 guide registrations completed for 2024 registrations. That's approximately 45% of our guides that have renewed within the first two months of our renewal period, which is awesome. Um, well, they've been coming in fast and furious on online, which is what we prefer and is wonderful. Um, we have 33 pending documentation to pending documents like they are still waiting. We're still waiting for documents from them. There's 115 in our queue. Uh, we're currently working on December 29th uh, applicants, so we're still within our 10 day to 10 business day processing window. And there's about 600 from 2023 that have yet to renew. So, like I said, about 45% of the total guides, over 100 of them are June 30th renewals that we won't be tackling until later. So we've uh, we've crossed the halfway threshold really for for 2024s. Um, issues that I've seen. Um, while we're still 25% ahead of last year's uh, renewals, we've done a lot of process improvements. Um, we continue to battle that 10 day limit um, when they come in faster, which is great, but it puts the, the, the uh, job on us, the burden on us to get those back out the window quickly. And Naomi and I have been streamlining and working with Brian to do as many process changes as possible to make it as efficient and quick without sacrificing um, accuracy. So hopefully we maintain that. Um, and then other than the usual complaints that trickle in, we, um, you know, it's full steam ahead with renewals currently. Any questions on where we are, where we, what we did last year, where we are right now? All right, we'll continue on. I'm going to then jump to Sergeant Galusha to give us a law enforcement update for the last year. Clint? Yeah, just real quick. Uh, it looked like maybe Val was trying to say something. Oh, sorry about that, Val. Go ahead. You're muted on your side. Oh, nope, maybe not. I will uh, I will just get started. Um, I'll just update everybody just kind of how our unit operates and, and how we work with the Marine Board. But um, I'm Clint Galusha. I'm the sergeant of our special investigations unit with the Oregon State Police, and we have uh, five full time detectives in the unit. Three of them are funded by anti poacher dollars and they are regional positions. So we have a northwest, uh, a southwest and an east region position. We have one detective uh, paid for by a DEQ, and so that is going to be environmental offenses. And then we have one full-time position paid for by the Marine Board for guiding outfitters. So my unit does get uh, tasked with assisting on a lot of different things around the state. And even though we have one position paid for through the, through the Marine Board for guiding outfitters, we do tend to um, break up those hours, which is about 1,700 hours um per year just due to the fact that the guide complaints come in from all around the state and that the the one position couldn't couldn't possibly travel without us uh, splitting up those those hours so that's kind of how we do it uh, we keep track of these these hours um for 2023 uh, i kind of try to keep a, a a track of just the complaints that are coming in um from either the the, the marine board um the tip line the OSP tip line uh, or just field complaints, whether it be from the state police, the county uh, or federal partners like the Coast Guard. Um, but for 2023, I had about 53 total complaints. Um, they they range in complexity. Um, they could be a, a false application for a guides license to the Marine Board all the way to uh, poaching while guiding uh, or just guiding without a license as most of you are familiar with and um, are aware of the significant impact to your business. Um, out of these 53 complaints, 
we have currently arrested, cited, or referred for prosecution or are attempting to cite uh, for arrest 17 different individuals uh, for 2023. For 2022, we had 43 complaints uh, come in through various means and had cited 10. Uh, I don't know the bleed over, so out of those, you know, there's still, you know, 30 or 27 outstanding complaints for 2022. Some of those are going to bleed over into 2023 and then bleed over into 2024. So there's kind of a rolling um, uh, amount of cases that keep compounding. But out of these 53, uh, we had 17. One was for forgery and guiding without a license. One was for forgery and false application for a guide's license. We have seven false applications for guides licenses. Um, we've had four guiding without a license. We've had four guiding uh, other crimes offenses, so it could be some combination of guiding without a license and or poaching, um, baiting bears, uh, unlawful takes. We've had various uh, guiding offenses uh, while guiding. So, and then like I said, in, in 2022, we've currently uh, are awaiting trial or uh, are still trying to locate some warrants. Um, but anyways, that's kind of in a nutshell, um, the cases we have currently. We do try to put any uh, significant case uh, resolutions through the court system into the newsletter. And so that's probably one of your best spots to see some of our, uh, our better outcomes from the court system. We uh, as a as an agency, um, take all these complaints seriously, and and but mostly are a reactionary unit, just due to the nature of having one person and uh, the amount of complaints that come in from around the state. So, um, yeah, I think that's Cindy about everything I wanted to uh, touch on. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is that the the UGA fund, we've been able to uh, get a lot of dollars back into that fund. And um, that I think has been a, a big benefactor and has ha helped generate some more complaints. And I think it's working. And so um, we are currently looking at possibly getting a, a significant outcome into that UGA fund. And so um, I'm hoping that it'll self-generate for quite a while with, with what we've had coming in. So anyways, appreciate it. Right, thanks, Clint. That's uh, so true. We'll go over the TIP uh, fund that's being held by UGA, Oregon Outfitter Guide Association, um, a little bit later in our agenda. But uh, first, I guess anybody have any questions for Clint? Go ahead, Bob. Uh, and I don't know if there's a raise hand feature here or not, but I'm happy to play by the rules if that's the case. I just can't find uh -huh. it. Up on here like uh, Zoom, but um, I don't know what's appropriate. I've had several members ask about a particular guide and what is the status and should we be reporting uh, him if he's guiding? So I don't know if that's appropriate to bring up here. Not, I don't have a problem doing that or if I should do that offline, but I do have several of my members asking about um, a particular person. So. Yeah, probably probably offline just due to the public nature and uh, the the business of investigation. It probably wouldn't be pertinent to do it in a public setting, but um, but yeah, offline if you want to reach out to Cindy or myself and and I could probably give you an update on on whatever it is you're looking for, Bob. OK, I appreciate that. I know Cindy's information um, is obviously at our fingertips, but uh, Maybe you're incorporated into the email chain. I'm not sure, but Cindy has your contact info as well. I'm sure, so we'll I'll reach out. Yeah, that's Absolutely. typically how I how I do get um, uh, a lot of the complaints will be filtered through Cindy, if if not through Oregon State Police or the Coast Guard or something. Okay, appreciate it. Yeah, right. thanks, Bob. And we do our best to share what we can, and of course, a lot of it is just waiting for court processes to to finish up. You know, for the case to actually be closed before we share it. Um, I know sometimes it's very frustrating when they're very visible or um, well known cases that we wish we could immediately get a, a result or outcome, but we do have to wait for them to actually be convicted or the case to be settled. So, mm -hmm. thanks for asking, Bob. 
Any yeah. other questions? Oh, go Sorry. ahead. Just a more of a comment, but you know, again, this was um, part of the reason the guide advisory committee was formed. But uh, just want to publicly thank you for the work around this. Um, it's something that we heard a whole bunch about, you know, many years ago prior to the formation of the guide advisory committee and a fund to address these issues. So. Um, I think you even had some of this in um, the agenda, which I ha I haven't reviewed this morning. But um, you know, do you guys have enough resources to feel that you know what what we've been trying to accomplish over the years is funded well enough to get the work done? Or you know, I, I know this is a time of year given we're in short session and long session is still you know over a year away, but um we just want to make sure that <clears throat> you know the bases are covered we still think it's a speaking on on my own behalf i think it's a doggone good deal for the services you provide that we pay just 150 dollars for our guides license so i just you know whether that discussion happens now or at a later date want to make sure you guys feel both at the marine board and at the enforcement level that you have the resources needed to continue and and if needed um, uh, increase the work or, or the resources needed to do the work thanks so much bob we'll uh we'll remind you of that later when we we're actually going to discuss it briefly in new business so um thanks for your comments appreciate that thank you any other comments for clint questions Hey Cindy, this is uh, Bill. Hey um, Bill. Am I? Are you guys hear me? So I had to do call in again. I can't. My my uh, Microsoft um, apparently sucks. So um, I just got one uh, question for. This is just for the enforcement side of it, and I'm. I'll uh, get right behind Bob on that one. That was pretty straight up. Um, one more thing for me that I thought was actually pretty thorough and I have a question on if it can actually increase was that uh, the, the guide saturation one single day that we had back in the late summer early fall for the Ridgefield zone um, I actually want to know if we can expand that type of um, that seemed to be a pretty good by state um, event. Is that something that can actually expand to different areas, different zones in multiple times of the year um, rather than just one, you know, concentrated effort um, zone? What do we what do we think about that? That was my yeah. question. Thanks, Bill. That's a great question. Um, if for those of you that don't know, we had uh, a guide enforcement day on the Columbia. Uh, we had 18 individuals between OSP, um, Multnomah County, uh, Clark County, Washington, Washington DFW, ODFW, and the Coast Guard. And we had five boats and we went both from Portland down to, I believe it's Warrior Rock, and then up to the Bonneville Dam. And it was actually something that was brought about by OSP um, a joint as a joint effort, and it was wonderful. I felt very fortunate yeah. that we had an individual with OSP that took the reins and, and started that, um, coordinated that enforcement day. We are definitely going to do more, and um, Brian and I have been talking about putting things on the calendar to do it in different areas as well. So. Thanks cool. for bringing well, I that just up. Wanna, I just want to applaud that. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. So, yeah, okay. just uh, just just so you know, we're we're aware that it was very successful, and um, we are looking for more of those partnerships moving forward. And we have a pretty good contact with the uh, the Coast Guard, and we rely heavily on Cindy, and uh, for those for those local. Uh, yeah. County Marine Patrols, and so yes, uh, we are looking at doing more future. Cool. Well, let's get that down into the estuary. I think it would be much more poignant, you know, with people getting out into the ocean with equipment that may not be subpar. You know, all sorts of different variables. That uh, that Ridgefield Zone was great for an in-river inland day, but man, 
we get that into the estuary and start looking into a bigger picture thing, that's that's pretty. That might get some people to actually pay attention, which is great. Yeah, Val, you had a question. I was just I put it in the chat, but the saturation patrols that they've done down here in our area, especially since we're similar with the with the border, um, we're really successful. Um, unfortunately, the last couple of years we haven't been able to do those because of the weather and the water conditions, but uh, it's been a great coordinated effort, so very successful. Great, thank you. And Brian. Thanks, Cindy. I just was going to add on that on that specific outfitter guide special emphasis patrol that was held. Um, there was 29 guide boats that were contacted and eight recreational boats in which there were 17 citations and 22 warnings. So pretty, uh, I guess you could say slightly disappointing on the compliance. Um, in, in, in respect, we also do a lot of spe special emphasis for recreational uh, boating safety, uh, including on the sleds, um the Tomac Bay area even on in drift boats so we don't necessarily focus on outfitter guides for those special emphasis which we make you know hundreds and hundreds of uh boater contacts during that time but we do uh do make contacts with guides during those those specific special emphasis um this past year and the year prior Bob yeah I um I'm, I wanted to add something as well that uh Cindy, I don't know if it's of any um, <clears throat> assistance to you, but I run the, the the consortium for Northwest Guides and Anglers Association, and I know that you guys are asking for drug cards. I'm not, still not sure, you know, given the time when I get those drug cards out, if um, that's, you know, a caveat for people getting their guides license or not. So that's a question I that is <laughs> seems to be perpetual for me, but. Uh, I also just want to offer up if it's of any assistance if I provide you with the names of the folks that have uh, re-enrolled in the random drug testing program as required by U.S. Coast Guard law. Is that something that would be useful if I sent that to you? Your list of those that are part of that consortium, that would be awesome. I would appreciate that. Okay, and if, if you <coughs> could just uh, provide any insight as to how much of a stickler is the Marine Board um, staff on having proof of enrollment when issuing the guides license? Yeah, and Bob, unfortunately, it's still pretty much the same thing. I mean, I definitely am asking for them, but it's not something that we could hold up a guide registration for because the fact that they have their current Coast Guard license um, being valid is all that we are re requested in statute or rule. So, um, you know, kind of that implication that if they have that, we know that they don't always have the consortium. Um, so, oh, I was just going to mention something else. Um, we actually have had several interesting scenarios this last year where the guides have either delayed or forgotten and and have not had a valid Coast Guard license at some point in during the guiding year. And we have, you know, essentially beached them from using motorized um, boats until they provide proof of their new requirement. And I don't remember ever really having to say, OK, I want those guide decals back for that motorized boat until I see your Coast Guard license. So. Um, well, I'll just make a final pitch that if, if you guys do those saturation patrols again that and I've had a booger of a time um, talking the Coast Guard into this, but it just seems if you guys are as thorough and I'm referencing really the Coast Guard thorough about checking guided outfitters that that would be one of the tick marks that you might look for is um, that motorized uh, captains operating motorized vessels do have that random drug testing um, proof of random drug testing consortium participation on their person as that is required by a lot of Coast Guard a couple of years ago did did really do some patrols to look specifically for that and and I'm sure the violations out there is are as gross as what you've identified in other areas of enforcement there so I would just encourage you to um, 
you know, you and the partners that you're working with to look for that uh, proof of um, participation. Right. Yeah, that is, that is currently on our list, so we will keep working towards legislation changes. So thank you, Bob. Thank you. If there's nothing else on enforcement, we will move on. Um, and speaking of, Clint made a good point about the number of complaints that come in through the tip line or through us or other sources. Um, we do field a lot of complaints and I'm going to let Brian Paulson take over um, the next item regarding the uh, non-criminal and criminal complaint process and there you go Brian. Thank you Cindy. So uh, this is this is part of old business uh, and just kind of a, a little bit of background to get everybody up to speed since it's been a while but uh, the Marine Board members directed agency staff back in January of 2023 to review the current ethical and professional standards and develop a formal complaint process to better address uh, more specifically non-criminal complaints. One of the challenges at that time was that our agency was receiving non-criminal complaints about outfitter and guides from the public, um, other outfitter and guides, and then also agency partners for uh, a multitude of alleged behavior from uh, conduct on social media, uh, offensive interactions between guides and, and the public. So uh, in rule, uh, you know, the Marine Board with input from the Guide Advisory Committee uh, will take recommendations to, you know, encourage the high standards of ethical conduct, you know, customer service, uh, safety, and then, you know, natural resource protection. So uh, outfitter and guide ethical and professional standards, those are in rule. There's 12 standards. Uh, there's also the piece on if an outfitter and guides registration license permit or certificate suspended or vote canceled or denied by another state agency or um, agency of the United States, so like Coast Guard license, then, then that'd be a violation as well. So there was discussion during the February 2023 Guide Advisory Committee meeting, which was um, where we discussed more specific concerns about revising the standards to incorporate things on social media uh, or defamation. Uh, this was this was perceived at that time and potentially more of a civil matter than really an ethical matter for an occupational license like the Marine Board Agency to consider taking action on that time. So following the, the Guide Advisory Committee meeting in February 2023, uh, agency staff, essentially Cindy and myself, uh, formalize the complaint process, we formalize an adverse action sanctions, and then the discipline model worksheet. Um, that uh, complaint process was included in the board book in April 2023, in which that's a publicly available board book that's on our agency website. Um, since March of 2023, we've uh, implemented that complaint process in which we have specifically applied that process to eight non-criminal complaints. Uh, most of those complaints are allegations of unprofessional conduct, uh, abusive language, or waste disposal, whether it's human waste or livestock waste. So um, I would open it up to discussion if needed, but we did provide uh, those formal uh, processes in the in the Guide Advisory Committee materials today for review. And thank you, Brian. The For those of you that are within the last, joining us within the last three or four years, you probably have not seen the more formal um, administrative action complaints, such uh, scenarios and the matrix that we use for determining our um, administrative actions and it's good to review and if you know of course if there's any input you have we'd appreciate it but we do try and make it as transparent and consistent as possible that we treat everybody in the same um, manner and to go through the same process the non-criminal complaint system having it be more formalized um, has been wonderful it's a uh, 
it's much easier for me to follow. We have templates for responses and timeframes for asking, you know, the guide to respond to the complaint and then forwarding that back to the complainant. So uh, if you, you know, have any questions about it, any uh, please speak up. I appreciate any comments. All right, good to see that none of you have been on that complaint list. <laughs> All right, next. Um, Give us Olden. time. <laughs> no, Val, you've had plenty of time. You're not getting there. <laughs> Cindy, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I assume if if a complaint is lodged against a guy that that either, I assume maybe you probably notify that guy. Like we would we would know that. So in a, it, just a real sy quick synopsis is that if we receive a complaint about a guide, we forward that complaint to the guide with a request for a response and kind of outlining our concerns, uh, you know, where it, it specifically contradicts um, the alleged alleged complaints, um, specifically contradict our ethics or actual statutes or rules. And they're given usually two weeks to respond. And we, Brian and I, review the response and take between, the, you know, the actual complaint letter and the guide's response whether or not it was substantiated as something that, or something that we can take further action on. And um, out of the eight that we've gone through this formal complaint, we've had one complaint withdrawn, which was wonderful after mis misunderstanding and then the other seven were found to be not substantiated or not anything that we could specifically take action with so um knock on wood i've not had anybody anybody that made the complaint come back with any response in return to that so i i would also offer up cindy with the one that was withdrawn it seems that this process has really shed light on being a win-win because it, though no, though we haven't taken any action on the specific complaints from this last year, it's definitely put the guides who've who had the complaints against them in check in regards to that that he, here's the ethical and professional standards. This was the complaint against you, um, and and I think it's it's really been a win-win because they they might get a little bit of a tune-up from the conversation. Yes, and um, to reiterate, the the uh, the guy does know that the complaint and the response is entered into their file. It's kept on file with them. And again, these are for um, non-criminal. Of course, anything that is criminal, we immediately forward towards Oregon State Police for Clint and his team to um, to review and investigate. So, Val, go ahead. I'd just like to say thank you to you and Brian for putting this together. Um, I think that um, in the future we're going to see it, it benefits from this, not only for perhaps public, but other guides that are complaining. And, and it's a process. And I just uh, really appreciate you going to the extent that you have and implementing it as well as designing it. Thank you, Val. Appreciate that. All right. Well, if there's no further comment on this, then I'll go to the Hunt Tag program. Um, at the last meeting we did, I stated that we were trying to get together a survey to send to the non-resident Hunt Tag um, program participants. We did so, um, and I included the results with your packets. It's all in blue. Um, I kept the responses confidential, but we did only, well, we got about 13 out of 40, 50 um, app, er, participants. And they were, uh, you know, across the board, they're all over the place, but essentially there was, there was quite um, support for not, uh, for limiting participation to one uh, participant per business. A lot of this will be, um, well, actually we did, after we, we received the results from the survey, we met with ODFW 
and we went over, um, we, re we revisited both the statutes and the rules for both organizations because it is a jointly managed program. There's statutes and rules for both ODFW and for us that manage the program. So that in itself is difficult, but we discussed ways to improve the system. Um, at this point, you know, ODFW mentioned that they had a new portal or an online system um, that took away a lot of the complaints about the faxing for tags and things like that, kind of antiquated systems. So now, although it's not running perfectly, I have heard mixed responses about it, but it should definitely be a better system for the for the guides to use and getting their tags. Um, but we agreed with ODFW to work cooperatively and it, we acknowledge the challenges that are inherent in this program because of its joint, um, you know, two agencies trying to figure out the best way to, to manage it. So there are definitely challenges in, in licensing and credentialing and enforcement. Um, Clint could certainly give you uh, an earful as far as how difficult it is to manage in the field. Um, so we'll be having more discussions. We had talked about um, creating some draft rules, but then we, our agency lost our policy manager, we went on to another agency. So we've uh, we've had a pause in that, but we will tackle it some more. There's nothing specific that I can mention as far as the ideas, because really we're just in the beginning of tossing around um, possible scenarios. So. I know that this program is very limited to a very specific number of guides, but do any of you have any questions on that? Nope. All right, on to the next, thank you. Um, tip program update. So the Turn In Poachers program that we joined last year, um, thank Brian Sykes for being our managing the funds. And he very nicely gave us an update on the on the um, the tip fund that is held. The you know as an agency we could not hold the money. So um, Brian and Oregon Outfitter Guide Association generously donated their a checking account and time to to manage this. So we started the program at the end of 2021. The both um, the OSNB and Uga donated an initial pot of $2,200, $2,400 to start. We've had three rewards checks go out, and the rewards at this point are $200 for a for a tip that uh, leads to a citation. It does not lead, have to lead to a conviction, but I do believe all of these did. Um, and then uh, we have had five checks as far as fines or restitution come back to us from the court systems to add funds to our system. So we're actually $800 ahead of where we started last year. Um, Clint, do you want to make any comment as far as how this has affected your work? Yeah, I think that it's a uh, I think that it's working. We definitely are getting uh, some tips. We have been able to pay out uh, like you said on some just should note that uh, when, when we get a tip we do put them in for restitution to be paid back into the the tip program we've been doing that for a while uh, with the uh, OHA with decoys and stuff like that so uh, we've been putting them in for the restitution but how we get ahead is uh, a, a complainant doesn't want to be put in for the reward or wants their um, Basically, they feel like it'd be better for them to remain confidential altogether and they didn't want uh, any part of the reward. So uh, anyways, the, the, not everybody has accepted the reward money, but um, some have. And, but in either case, we've still been able to put people in for the restitution amount. And for those that are interested, they are someone who turns in a tip is. Um, is. Able to get both an outfitter guide tip reward as well as an OHA points or uh, funds so they can double up or um, the rewards if it if it applies. And Brian, do you have any comments for Brian Sykes for um, as far as from your end of things? Um, no, it feels good to send those checks out when we when we can. 
Yes, but, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's easy to manage on our end. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Certainly appreciate it. Um, any other comments? I think uh, Clint did mention earlier that um, there is some anticipation. We have heard rumors of a larger uh, fine being deposited to this tip po poacher, turn and poacher fund. So hopefully that does take place and we'll let you know about it when it does. Yeah, right. I don't want to get into too many details on, on stuff like that, but sometimes we are able to um, uh, we get to work with an individual to allocate where some of the restitution goes. And so in this case, we're hoping we could uh, get some of the restitution to uh, the UGA tip fund. Yes, thank you. And hopefully that will continue and, and gain popularity with uh, courts. So. Thanks. Um, now, if you'll bear with me, I'll you know, try attack this technology and switch share my screen. Um, I wanted to share a new uh, feature that we are just about to reveal to all of the guides as well as the public. It is on our website, but let me see if I can share my screen. Oh, there it is. Thanks. Okay, so can you all see the Rainboard homepage? Hopefully. Um, so if you go to, this is on the homepage, the header, this is where you find the guides and charters page. This is also a newer feature called Maps and Apps. We've had it in different places, but now this is where they've decided it should live. So if you click on Maps and Apps and scroll, right now we're at the bottom of the page, but there is an Outfitter Guide dashboard. And so we're taking um, information directly from our database and loading it into this interface where the public can search for um, information about guides. It currently uses only takes uh, active or pending outfitter guides, so none that are expired or suspended, so they would not be able to contact them. But essentially, we're trying to get the public to be able to contact those that are working in or want to be in specific areas um, and in specific uh, services. So whether it's hunting, fishing, bike riding, whatever they can find it. This map is just for informational, so that gives an idea of where what. Uh, area they want to pick. So if I was going to pick the Wallawa area and say I wanted to um, see if there were any biking guides in Wallawa, in the Wallawa district, and then it will show you there's a total of eight currently that are active. And uh, if you click on any one of them, then you get their their information. Uh, so, you know, website address, if they have it, phone number, or email, and also the other areas that they provide the services in. Uh, they can download this entire map. Um, they can also search for somebody specific. So, if I was looking for Brian, I think we're a little slower here. You might have to take the filters off, Cindy, at the top. Oh, sorry, you're right. There's Brian. Thanks, Brian. Brian, here's Brian. Um, yes, yeah, so you've got all the information right away. I will let you know that we are not putting employee information on there. So some guides have registered uh, deckhands uh, that work or whitewater rafting guides may have individually registered guides that um, do some fishing for them. Those guides are not on here. We really wanted to direct the, the contacts to the owner or the primary person. Um, so does anybody have any questions about this? This is live on our website. It gets the information gets refreshed monthly currently. Um, 
So right now it is limited to this. I think there's about 800 guides on here right now, but as they renew, they'll be added back in. So. I can't see anybody, so if you have any comments, just speak up. There's a, um, Mia put one in the chat. It said the dashboard was great for visitors. Does Travel Oregon know about this? Um, I was actually, that's a good question, Mia. Thank you. Um, I was waiting for, to roll it out to you folks before I send it out, but yes, it is going to be uh, definitely going to be Travel Oregon's um, point. I think this is where we want them to go first to look for guides. So, um, because it is real time, well, almost real time, um, but it is, you know, it's the most accurate source of current guide registrations for the for the public. Any other comments? Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. All right, I think we're back. Um, oh, I shouldn't have stopped sharing because it, if there's no, if there's nothing else about that one, I did. I was in a meeting with um, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and um, they shared with me. We're talking. They're they're doing a report to uh, look into. Um, ways of tackling their re re regulations and enforcement and um, the shared information about Washington's fishing guide logbook. And, and so I'm not going to go through this. It is included in your um, the paperwork in the board book for the meeting, but I just thought they've already created the system. It's both uh, a, a e you know electronic site as well as a or a paper logbook, but we have so many discussions that um, where we're we're stuck trying to figure out how to prove something like how to prove usage or catch rates for guides or you know overcrowding, and um, we don't have the data. So hopefully in the future we'll be discussing with ODFW opportunities such as this and this is nice to see that there is already something out there that is being used that seems to be working so um i i leave that for you to to look at uh, at your leisure i'm not going to bore you with all the the bits so hey hey said is this bill hi bill I, I was looking at that. Sorry, I can't do teams raise hand thing. I'm really sorry about that, you guys. I actually um, don't. I <laughs> was, <laughs> sorry. I was looking at this overall structure, but they and we see that. Do you see us incorporating that anytime soon? Um, kind of verbatim per se on um, their overall. Um, they're running. They're not like completely successful with it. But it is showing to be, you know, working. It's giving them data. It's showing them all the things, which is great. Do we want to um, kind of copy that um, coming up soon, or are we going to wait and hold tight? Um, and then I have another question after you answer that one. Well, I'll I'll rely on Brian's help with this question as well. So go ahead, Brian. Yeah, gr great question. I think. With Washington having their, and correct me if I'm wrong, Cindy, but their their fish and wildlife and their uh, their licensing agency for outfitter, outfitter guides are under the same roof. Where, yeah, generally speaking, our state's unique in that it's it's two different roofs, two different agencies. I yep. this you know we're really the occupational licensing agency. We're not the one that's managing the resource or those type of things. Though we often get questions about, you know, uh, the number of guides or you know opportunity those type of things, we would defer most, of, you know, most of that to ODFW. If there was ever any desire to implement any any kind of um, logbooks, that would come generally from ODFW, and then we would have to 
somehow partner with them only because of the the part that we you know license and credential outfitter guide so our agency would not be a lead on this if it was ever even uh on odfw's radar i know cindy and i often you know uh have conversations with them but this hasn't came up nor has it been a desire copy yeah i agree uh bill we also looking at the the language as far as a uh, statute or rule that washington relies on it's a lot a lot to do with natural resources and you know we really don't even have the authority to venture into that um area so it would have to be yeah. a joint Work. effort um and val right. put in comments too alaska uses this um was started i think with the saltwater fishing but they've expanded i believe to you said to rivers as well some rivers yep okay <laughs> great great feedback there you are correct yeah washington washington does have the, the authority for for like a resource base rulemaking where we you kind of don't but odfw does so that would be uh, that would be a real that's going to take some undertaking so i get it i just we want to anticipate what we need to kind of like judge for in the future on what our needs are going to be or what the overall what we're going to try and at least tell to our youth bob reese and, and i we speak to a lot of people um guys mainly and we want to say hey this is coming um, and if it is, that's something that ODFMW probably wants to partake in because they're seeing a lot of complaints about, you know, guides' faults for this. It's guides, the uh, guides are, you know, guides are ruining the world, they think. And that's just, that's just <laughs> not the case. The, the department does see it that we take out the people who don't have access to resources that otherwise want to have access to. They buy licenses, blah, blah, blah. You already know. Um, so right. that's, that's great. so that it, was, it's interesting to see, you know, how different states deal with the different, um, you know, issues to tackle. I know Jason with Idaho, I mean, really the your outfitter guide agency regulates the number of guides and where they can fish and yeah. all of that. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jason. I would just recommend to keep, if you're going to implement any paperwork, you got to simplify things. The Washington logbook's a real pain. Um, They're complicated, yeah. You take me, for instance, I launch in Washington, travel up through the corridor between Washington and Idaho, cross into Oregon, where then I'm in a special use permit area. So I have Washington paperwork, Forest Service paperwork, now Oregon paperwork. It's getting to be too much. Um, I'm not an advocate for these logbooks. I think they just... For one, <clears throat> we don't have uh, good cell service and stuff in a lot of the places for us to use an app. We have adverse weather to try to fill out paper log books in the rain sometimes. It's just really a hassle. And I understand they're, they're trying to collect data for some reason, but if my, my advice would just be keep it as simple as possible to take some of the burden off of your guides. It is really a pain to do in the dark, in the morning, when you're trying to get started. And I understand the the idea behind it, but let's keep it simple. Mm -hmm. You know, Brian and I were talking about uh, getting joint, trying to piggyback upon ODFW's um, e-license and whether or not, you know, a guide could scan a QR code from a, from a client and then just claim, you know, whatever the client tagged in that uh, scenario as you know a guided trip so I mean things like that you have to we, you're exactly right try and make it simple yeah Val do you okay, want to I have I have yep oh uh, sorry about that go ahead Val I, I know I cut you off earlier copy okay and then my last question when you said you had this other meeting with Washington on the Washington side of the Washington Guides Association, when we started the Columbia River chapter, um, we haven't been able to make any headway with um, legislation on the below Longview Bridge thing. And you know, I've just all I do is I talk about that, blah, blah, blah. But did they mention that to you? Did you mention it to them? Is there any talks about um, trying to open that back up per se on a movement, you know, down to like the Astoria Bridge, something? you know, 
something that would Bill, be all, I've, all I've seen is just where they've gathered the information about other states in the Northwest. So I'm, I have not hmm. seen any, you know, any direction that they want to go in. Huh. Okay. At least that's they haven't okay. shared that with me yet. So let's just say that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Val, I know I did cut you off several times already. Go ahead. Uh, no, I, I put most of it into the chat, but um, you know, I, I would I would echo what Jason was saying too in some ways because the um, the logbooks that we filled out for many years in California, and then we needed to utilize those in fights against endangered species and that sort of thing. They deemed our our data to be invalid because it was not reliable. So they wouldn't utilize any of the data that we had submitted. And I don't I don't know how agencies feel about that. We ran into a similar problem up in Alaska when it came to using the data from the logbooks on the river to be able to get allocation. So, you know, I, I honestly I'm not a huge fan of the logbook. It just depends on what you want to do with the data that you're trying to collect. Okay, good point. Thank you. All right, like I said, that was for your, um, you know, review on your own time. Let's move on to um, it. This sounds like a big topic, but really it's just a small topic. It's the evaluation of fees. Um, I'll let Brian speak mostly, but we really, yeah. you know, go ahead, Brian. Sorry. Yeah, no, thanks, Cindy. I just kind of more just purely informational in that. Um, you know, our agency's, agency staff is going to be evaluating our outfitter guide program more for like a viability standpoint. Um, just to be kind of transparent, our current fees and fee structure, those outfitter guide program fee revenues have not been reaching what our um, budget that's been approved by the legislature expenditures are, and that's specifically the outfitter guide program. Um, but it also doesn't meet, you know, our obligation for the enforcement contract with Oregon State Police. Um, this is something that we'll be working through the next year. Um, you know, any changes to those type of things, whether it's the fees and or fee structures, those those will be completed through a public process, whether it's the legislature and or our board. Um, but that's one thing, you know, for us um, with the viability of the program, the, re the, the revenues don't um even come close to what the 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 approved budget is so the guide fees and, and those type of things really haven't had any changes in about a decade uh so it's one of those things that uh you know we just as a viability of the program we got to evaluate and see where things are at so just purely informational um but just wanted to make that noted thank you brian any questions about that currently? I do. Are Go you ahead, anticipating? Are you anticipating that process to be completed in like the next year? Maybe a legislative concept coming forward for the next legislative session? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, great question. Great question, Val. Um, so any kind of changes to fees or fee structure would generally have to go through a legislature uh, just because our our fees are in statute and rule. Um, so that would be a public process. Um, you know, overall, the the process I would anticipate if there was anything that was going to happen, it would be publicly known within the next year. Um, it might be sooner. Um, you know, those timelines and, and processes uh, really aren't defined right now. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, Bob Reese here. <clears throat> um, you guys, do you know how under met, if that's appropriate term, um, what's the discrepancy between what we're paying out for fees and what you're spending? Like, which would in turn give you an idea what you would model for a fee increase? <clears throat> so, uh, I don't, I don't have that information available uh to disseminate i the you know the the one thing with our fee structure for example uh we charge 
uh, a specific amount for non-residents that's different than residents. You know, there's there's a lot of different ways that money goes in, and that's all something that we'd have to consider as well, right? So we've seen outfitter guide uh, registrations increase. Um, we also see a lot more uh, people having employee lists, right? So we just we just got to balance, and and it has to do with actual costs. It's not like we're going after fees that are a tax. It's it's literally fees that are the actual cost. So. Um, as information is available, we'll definitely share it with the committee, but I don't have that right now. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be bringing this information to you with, as we um, start to discuss it more. So, but early days, thank you. Um, and then for the last item on the agenda, the Guide Advisory Committee Charter Review and Recruitment, I do have to say that Randy Turney um, the representative from McKenzie River Anglers has let me know that he is uh, resigning for his position. That position um, typically does get refilled within their association. So I anticipate hearing from Randy or one of the members of the that McKenzie River Anglers um, shortly to see who will be taking his place. And I'm also sorry to say that Jim Blount let me know that he's not been guiding lately, Jim. Thank you so much for being with us the last few years. I appreciate that um, and your perspective for the non-fishing, non-hunting guy, which we don't see too much of. Um, I appreciate you taking the time and being with us. Um, and if you, Brian will talk more about recruitment and the, the charter, but if you have any uh, nominations or people you'd like to put forward, we'd always appreciate hearing from you. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure being on the committee and I don't have any nominations uh, at this time, but I will think about it and see if I can come up with some people. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, Brian, you have, um, I know we've talked about this many times in the past. We've never actually formally adopted the charter. Brian has put it into a much more legible, readable format, um, which was included in your packet. But Brian, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Cindy. So the the guide advisory committee charter it was it was drafted back in 2014, but it was never formally adopted. And I'm sure there's people on this committee now that were really the the foundation to to formulating that. Um, so agency staff, myself and Cindy, we've we've completed the 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 charter. We've formally adopted it this month. Um, it's provided in the committee book, which is also uh, available to the public via the public meeting page on the agency website. Uh, so just wanted to go through the charter uh, and I can share my screen or you can look on yours appropriate. What would you prefer, Cindy? Um, does everybody have their information that they need or did they review it, were able to review it? OK, Brian, go just go ahead and go over it. Yeah, so uh, the, the charter has 11 sections, if I recall. Um, it's going to have the purpose of the Guide Advisory Committee. It's going to have the authority, which is in statute and rule. It's going to have the duties and responsibilities of the committee. Uh, the committee composition, which, uh, is, which is in statute and rule of both. Uh, it has the frequency of the meetings, the objective of committee meetings, meeting agenda, uh, minutes of the meeting, reporting, uh, committee performance evaluation, and then the tenor of committee members or essentially term limits. And that's that's the thing that we really uh, got to hone in on today is that there's there's folks on the committee that have uh, surpassed their term limits. And, and one of the things that we'll be doing uh is having to recruit for that so recruiting for the guide advice committee that'll be a public process where we'll send out um uh, a public notice we'll have an a form to application to fill out and then uh, that'll uh hopefully we're not going to have half the committee that has to turn over this year but uh we'll, we'll definitely be um very strategic on how we do that. So is this when you want me to pull up the term limits, Cindy, or? Yeah, go ahead, Brian. 
So let me see if I can share my screen. And just give me a go ahead, Cindy, if you can see that. Yes, we can. We see it. All right. So I I put together this quick sheet that has uh, essentially member terms in which and then it also has the, the membership type. So there's very specific uh, descriptors, whether it be a public member or organization member. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, the public member for the charter, which it's it's very specific that that can't be more than one that needs to be filled. Uh, we have uh, Oregon Outfitter Guide Association that will member that will need to be filled. We'll have a Northwest West Guides and Anglers uh, vacancy, McKinsey River Guides, South Coast Guides, and then one other organization uh, member of the, the, the advisory committee that we'll need to fill this year. So as you can see, uh, as you go down the, this list, it shows the membership type, which can be referenced in the charter. And then it'll show the representation region from that specific organization or uh, that tag via public. And then it also has the member name and then you know their their tenor. So um, I'll let you take it from there, Cindy. Uh, my my plan is to to send out the notice to recruitment uh, in the next month uh, and and have uh, you know that set in place before our next meeting. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, and you know, unfortunately, this meet is a huge hit to us as far as uh, historical reference and just experience. And um, I know all of you that have been on it since 2014 knew this time was coming, <laughs> but we will be missing, hugely missing you. Um, but yeah, we're hoping uh, those that are members of the association can either put forward um, members for nomination or um, for our consideration and those that are not specifically tied to a guide association, uh, whether we can, you know, at large, we can come up with something. We, um, yeah, I, I welcome any comments. Get me out of this job. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's those are the things I'm going to miss, Bob. Jeez. Um, yeah, it's uh, this is going to. I believe we'll be ending up having to fill five positions, um, so that's going to be a huge turnover. Um, but I think with your help, we can find you know some good, uh, fresh perspectives and, and you know important voices to hear within the guide advisory committee. Yeah. No. We look forward to that recruitment notice and appreciate all the time and effort that staff, uh, both at OSP and Oregon State Marine Board, to put into this process. I, I don't think any of us think it's a waste of time. So, well, job well done. Yeah, I've got a comment too. Uh, yeah, I have really enjoyed being on this group, and I think we've probably done a really good job of, of sort of setting up a framework. Uh, I know I fish on the bar on the LC all the time. I work with about five or six different guides. I'm on the uh, port commission, um, but I'm retired and I want to get, I, just like Bob, I want to get replaced. Thanks. <laughs> Val, did you have a comment? Oh, there you are. Yeah, I, I'm trying to let Gary talk here. Go ahead, yeah. Gary. I've been around all these guys down here my whole life too, you know. And they keep. I'm, I'm like, I'm like the guy that's the only guy doing this, and I can't find anybody else that wants to do this. So, I'm happy to turn it over to somebody else. But, you know, it can't be done. It can't be done. But I can't. We can't go on down here and not have representation. Period. That's where I come in. I agree. Thank you for that yeah, point of view. Yeah, I, I think that's right. It. I think they're a small subset of people that are qualified and are interested in doing this. So uh, I think we need to to work really hard to find some replacements, but I don't think it's like like down in your area. I just don't think you cannot have a representative on the guides. So guides stuff here. At the 
Yeah, we've got to have one. Yeah, no, that's certainly a high priority. Yeah, well, I would just ask. From the forgotten been. part of the state. <laughs> we don't forget about you, but go ahead, Brian. Sorry. I, I was just going to add that, you know, we don't take this recruitment lightly and we will uh, we will make sure that we fulfill our commitment to to meet what this committee is all about. So. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Definitely. We will continue to rely on your opinions. You just have to forward it to us separately. <laughs> all right. Does anybody have anything for roundtable? Good of your order. I am anticipating scheduling another guide advisory committee meeting for April. Hopefully before things get too busy for everyone. Um, I will pull put out a doodle poll like I did. It seems to work um, for the most part. So uh, I appreciate you participating in those things. But if you have any month long vacations or something, let me know and we'll see what we can do. If nobody else has anything else to add, I'm going to adjourn the meeting at 1118. I thank you all very much. Have a good day. Thanks, Cindy. Right. Thanks, Clint. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you.